Hello and welcome to Commodity Culture, where we break down the commodity space for both new and experienced investors. And today we're doing a deep dive into another uranium company, and that would be Energy Fuels. Now before we get started, standard disclaimer, none of this is investing advice. Do your own due diligence, and I do own shares in Energy Fuels. Now before we dive in, I want to talk a little bit about investor psychology and investor biases in my own case, which is something that kept me away from Energy Fuels for a while until I really came to my senses. And that is that as a uranium investor, I always wanted to be different than anybody else. Uh, it's been the same in my entire life as well. That's a thing that can both serve me and it can go against me. But when I first got into the uranium space and I knew absolutely zero, and you're gonna laugh at this, but I went through and all of the Reddit message boards on uranium, I paid close attention to and followed uranium Twitter, and I made sure to, whenever a company was mentioned or a company's ticker was mentioned, I would give it a point in this spreadsheet I had to just see amongst the retail crowd out there online what was the most popular company. And this seems crazy in terms of research, but this is when I was first starting out getting my lay of the land. I just wanted to understand which companies maybe I should be taking a look at. And by far and above, Energy Fuels came up as the most mentioned, the most talked about. Everybody was the most bullish about it. So you'd think that this was a company I would really want to look into, but for me, I like to go against the grain. And I thought, oh, everybody's interested in that company, so maybe I should be looking elsewhere. And that kept me away from Energy Fuels, from looking at it seriously for a while. And I just wanted to give that lesson to you guys that what brought me to my senses was that I did a poll on Twitter because for me it was time to buy a uranium company in America because I like to uh, diversify geographically with my portfolio. And I put the question, which company should I be taking a look at? And once again, no surprise, Energy Fuels won out by quite a landslide or it was quite close to Uranium Energy Corp, I think. But nonetheless, it caused me to take a closer look at the company and do a deep dive into it. And I have to say, I'm so glad I did because it is now the single largest position in my portfolio when it comes to uranium. Today, we're gonna to talk about why. I've said this before, the very first thing I look at when I evaluate a company is debt. Again, it's not the end all or be all, whether a company has or doesn't have debt doesn't instantly make it more or less attractive, but it's definitely a figure that interests me and Energy Fuels has zero debt. Now the major bullish factor for Energy Fuels, which I'm gonna start off with here, is it has produced uranium in the past. Not a small amount of uranium, not just a test case of, hey, we're gonna to try to produce something and see if we can do it. No, they are the number two largest American producer of uranium since 2006. Cameco's operations in America are the only uh, projects that have produced more uranium than energy fuels. In fact, they've produced 15.6 million pounds of uranium since 2006, and their White Mesa mill is the only operational uranium mill in all of the United States, and it has produced 39 million pounds of U308 since 1980. All of these things are major because there's very few companies that are producing currently. Some are producing very small amounts. You, of course, you have Cameco, Cameco and Kizadam Prom who are actively producing a lot, but Energy Fuels is as close as you can get to currently producing. And with that proven track record of producing that many pounds, there is almost nobody out there in the space that comes close when it comes to a development company. Now you could call Energy Fuels a developer because they're technically not producing uranium right at this moment, but as we'll talk about later, they're looking to go into production fairly quickly here, and so you could almost put them into that producer category. Now in addition to producing that much uranium in the past, Energy Fuels has a huge amount of different projects. They have around 10 combined from conventional mining and in situ mining in various stages of development. But one amazing fact is that they have 81 million pounds of measured and indicated uranium resources under the ground. This is larger than any other US uranium company and means that moving forward, they'll have a lot of resources. Now measured and indicated is one step below proven and probable, but is still a fairly uh, accurate number in terms of the degree of confidence you can have in it. 
So in addition to having this vast reserve of measured and indicated resources under the ground, Energy Fuels has three mines on standby at the moment. You've got the Pinion Plain mine. I believe that's an underground mine. You've got Alta Mesa, which is ISR. You've got Nichols Ranch, which is also ISR in situ recovery. And with Alta Mesa and Nichols Ranch, they've already produced millions of pounds in the past. So putting them on restart is going to require much less capex than the vast majority of projects out there, which leads us to the fact that Energy Fuels is currently talking to a lot of utilities in the U.S. Uh, Mark Chalmers, the CEO, has come out and said that, particularly due to the situation happening with Russia Ukraine at the moment, their phones are ringing when it comes to U.S. utilities who are looking to move away from Russian product and look for domestically sourced uranium. Now, the whole Russia Ukraine conflict can definitely have an impact on the uranium space. You can click a link above to watch an interview I did with Terry Papineau, where he dove into the reasons why. But I think even putting that situation aside, we're going to be looking for more domestically sourced uranium in the US due to the whole trend of deglobalization, breakdown of supply chains, um, and some other reasons as well. And they also already do have a uh, contract, long-term contracts, with US utilities through 2030. So this is a base quantity of 3 million pounds of uranium up to 4.3 million pounds starting in 2023. So that is a huge sign. Utilities are entering into long-term contracts again, um, as particularly an American utility looking for a, a US source product. I think this trend is going to continue as we talked about they're already getting phone calls and having those conversations. So I think we are going to see more long-term contracts announced potentially this year and in the years ahead. With all these factors in mind, Mark Chalmers has said that Energy Fuels is looking to potentially even start some uranium production this year in 2022. He mentioned the end of the summer as a potential date to begin uh, producing again to put the mines back online. And if not, I think at least within the next one to two years, we're going to see production come out of energy fuels. I've said this before when I was talking about Global Atomic last week going into production. This is even more bullish because of how they've already proven they can produce millions of pounds, second largest producer besides Cameco in the U.S. Um, this is massive. Me personally, when we talk about investing in the uranium space, I don't mess with explorers. I try to take the least amount of risk possible for the highest reward and a developer or you could call them a developer moving into production at this phase for me is just, uh, I'm super bullish guys, let's put it that way. Another thing to note is the two ISR mines currently on standby waiting to restart are located in mining friendly jurisdictions of Texas and Wyoming. So you have a much friendlier relationship between the governing bodies and energy fuels or any other producer in the area. So that's a huge plus in my book. So we haven't even gotten into rare earths yet, which is a whole other area to explore because energy fuels is also trying to position itself as one of the largest rare earths producers in America. Rare earths are used in smartphones, computer hard disks, lasers, they're used in aerospace technology, they're used in satellites, wind turbines, and electric cars. The IEA predicts that demand will grow threefold at least by 2040. Um, we'll see, but the fact is that rare earths are needed for so many things and the majority of the world relies on China, which is of course an issue as we see trends of deglobalization accelerating all around the world. In fact, China produces 38% of rare earth supply, which is the largest chunk out of any country, but they refine over 60% of all rare earths used anywhere. So this is a real issue, particularly when it comes to where things are headed at the moment in China. We're seeing insane zero COVID lockdown policies where they'll just lock down entire cities seemingly for the hell of it. Um, I don't know where they're going with that agenda, but it's causing supply chain disruption. We could see a potential hot war between China and the West. There's so many scenarios that are playing out that could lead to many parts of the world not readily having access to rare earths from China. So they are desperately needed. An American source is desperately needed. And, um, you know, very few areas of the world have rare earths. 
in, they're, they're not uncommon overall in the Earth's crust, but concentrated deposits of them that allow for economic mining are particularly rare. So uh, Energy Fuels is currently processing monazite. So monazite is a mineral that contains within it six rare earth elements. It has 55% rare earths by weight, and that makes it one of the most critical and important minerals in the world at the moment. And this is what Energy Fuels is focusing on. Monazite sand is currently produced as a byproduct of heavy mineral sand mining around the world. And Energy Fuels is currently using this material to extract rare earths from. Now it should be noted that the White Mesa Mill is the only facility in North America that can currently process monazite. So that's a huge factor. Energy Fuels is, however, looking for a larger, more readily accessible source of monazite to then process into rare earths, and they have recently acquired a rare earth land position in Brazil. This is a 58.3 square mile project, contains significant quantities of monazite that could potentially feed the White Mesa Mill for decades to come. Now, this is a very recent development. This is something that anybody who holds shares in energy fuel should be keeping their eyes on. It is not a surefire bet. I do not believe we have any of the economics out yet in terms of how easily this monazite is to access, what the mining methods are that are going to be used, and the overall picture. So not a surefire bet, but it's a very good sign and something to keep an eye on. So as I mentioned, Energy Fuels has already been processing rare earths. There's a rare earth carbonate that's apparently a very high quality that they have been extracting from this monazite sand, and they have shipped it to a company called Neo Performance Materials for separation. This is apparently a kind of a test run for what will hopefully be a longer term relationship between the two companies that could bolster Energy Fuels rare earth business significantly. Some other things to mention when it comes to energy fuels, as if all of that wasn't enough, is vanadium for one. Um, vanadium is used in steel, high strength alloys, aerospace engineering, chemicals, and as well as grid scale batteries. Um, it is not something that I look at really strongly when I'm taking a look at energy fuels. I look first and foremost at uranium and then rare earths and then everything else is kind of a bonus. But the White Mesa is also the only operational vanadium mill in the United States and energy fuels currently has over 31 million pounds of measured and indicated vanadium in the ground more than any other U.S. producer. They also carry 1.4 million pounds of vanadium on the books, which was produced at White Mesa. They are selectively selling when the prices are profitable for them. And uh, I think the vanadium component of their company is definitely something to keep an eye on. Energy Fuels is also sitting on 692,000 pounds of uranium. The value on the books is $23.79. The price now is quite a bit higher than that. The same should, should be said of their vanadium inventories, a value of $5.36 a pound on the book, current price around $10. So we're looking at a decent amount of profit made. And the fact that inflation is raging at the moment almost makes me prefer, probably does make me prefer, them having these physical assets on the balance sheet as opposed to cash, which is losing value by the year. Finally, Energy Fuels is also looking at potentially getting involved in medical isotopes, providing medical isotopes to pharmaceutical companies to make anti-cancer treatments. I haven't even looked into that a little bit. That's something that they've, that's early days for them and that is something we might want to watch in the next several years to see how it develops but I'm not too interested in it at the moment, to be honest. Concerns, what could go wrong? It was pretty tough for Energy Fuels for me to come up with too much, but I will say it almost feels like they're doing too many things at once. And that is one of the things that initially turned me off of them was I was asking myself, are these guys a uranium company? Are they a rare earths company? Are they a vanadium company? Are they making anti-cancer treatments? They've also got a nuclear fuel recycling um, program, I believe. So they've got all of these different things. It almost feels like, what do they say, too many cooks in the kitchen or too, fingers in too many pots or however you want to put it. Um, it feels like they're doing too many things and they're not ultra focused on just uranium. So... I get concerned that they could potentially um, dilute their efforts over too many projects and not push any particular project forward significantly, significantly as much as it could be 
if they just focused on that. Now, speaking of diluting efforts, we can also talk about diluting shareholders. Um, their shares issued has increased 12% over the past year. They've done a decent amount of dilution in the past, so some shareholders bring that up as a gripe. I'm personally not majorly concerned because issuing shares is how they've been raising capital to advance all of their projects. The share price has done well until recently when, of course, shares in almost any type of company anywhere in the world have taken a significant hit. But I do not have a major issue with the share dilution that's occurred so far. Uh, it's the way to fund their projects, but I would definitely keep an eye on it moving forward to see if that trend continues and if it has a significant effect on the share price. So just something to watch for. Finally, they have an extremely low insider ownership percentage. And I wonder if anybody's asked Mark Chalmers this question or if it's been addressed because I have not seen it addressed in any of the material that I've looked through. They only have a 2% ownership percentage. That is pitifully low. Um, and I think that number should be higher. So that's one thing I'd like to see management have more skin in the game and hopefully they will put their money where their mouth is in a more significant way in the future. All right, guys, that's it for me. Thank you very much for joining the program. I hope you found it useful. If you have, please do like and subscribe and hit that bell notification. And I recently did an interview, in fact, it was this week, with Mart Walbert, the author of Uranium Newsletter, Contrarian Codex. That video is going to appear on the screen, so please click that and check it out if you have interest in the uranium industry. Commodity Culture is a series on commodities and natural resources. If you would like to see more, be sure to subscribe and hit the bell notification so you're always up to date with the latest episodes.